Thank you so much. And I want to thank all the organizers for this kind invitation to speak. Really delighted to be here and to share some of our work. And before I start, just want to check that everybody can hear me okay and can see the slides. Yeah, okay, great. So um, mechanical forces can strike cells anywhere at any time. And they can be different types of mechanical stimuli that cells experience. These can, exp uh, these can include osmotic pressure uh, from the fluid surrounding them, uh, uh, shear stress from the flow of that fluid, strain forces as tissue grows and distends and cells connect with each other and pull on each other, as well as physical properties of the substrate, such as stiffness and nanotopology. And these mechanical forces can be presented in different temporal fashions. They can be sustained over time. Uh, it can be a brief pulse, or it can be a, a train of repetitive stimuli. And all of these, over the last few decades, we have realized that the mechanical forces powerfully impact cell behavior. And for that to happen, these forces have to be converted into electrical and chemical signals that can regulate pathways inside the cell, gene expression, as well as metabolism. So it's really important for a cell to be able to keep track of all the different mechanical stimuli it's constantly exposed to and do it in a way that it can also differentiate different stimuli of different types and in different uh, regions of space. And so this is no small task and cells have, de have developed many different systems for detecting and transducing mechanical forces. One class of proteins that does that is ion channels. And these have several properties that make them particularly well-suited for these tasks. Now, ion channels are proteins that sit in the plasma membrane of cells, and they have the ability to open and close just like a door. And they're in mechanically activated ion channels. There's a subclass of channels that opens or closes in response to mechanical stimuli. So when the pore is open, ions can flow into or out of the cell, depending on the electrochemical gradient. Now, these mechanically activated channels can open fast. We are talking sub-millisecond timescales. They can be exquisitely sensitive to mechanical force. They, their activity generates both electrical and chemical activity, and they have a number of features that changes, and this can be specific to a certain type of channel. So for example, they can desensitize in response to persistent stimuli that is spontaneously in, uh, inactivate or adapt. They can have a large dynamic range, which means that they can detect really small forces as well as big forces. And they can, uh, in some channels, can retain sensitivity to subsequent stimuli, whereas others may not be sensitive. Maybe that first pulse that it sees shuts it off for a period of time. And thus, they, you know, they're, depending on how a channel responds to rep repetitive mechanical stimuli, the signal transduction can be very different, and so the downstream consequences can be very different. So these, uh, these characteristics of speed, sensitivity, and versatility make them really important first responders and sig uh, signal integrators of mechanical forces. Now, the first, actor, the first evidence for the existence of mechanical forces came from beautiful work done by David Corey and Jim Hutzpeth in the late 70s. And here they were looking at, uh, at inner ear hair cells, and they showed for the first time that these cells had mechanically activated uh, currents. Uh, a few years after that, Fred Sachs, uh, Sachs's lab showed in chick skeletal muscles the presence of uh, mechanically activated channels as well, and these were stretch activated, act that is activated by membrane stretch. Uh, shortly after, they were also discovered in bacteria as well as in plants. Now, in bacteria and plants, within a few years of the identification of the currents, the molecular identity of the channels proteins was known. But for the vertebrate channels, it took a long time. It took another 30 years before the first excitatory mechanically activated channel family was identified, the PSO channel family by Adam Paraputian's lab. And over the next decade, little over a decade or so since the channels were discovered, they've emerged to be really important for a variety of physiological processes across the body. And in recognition of the importance and impact of this discovery, Adam Paraputian was awarded the Nobel Prize in a couple of years ago. 
So I've been fascinated by the Piazza channels ever since Arden's lab discovered them in 2010. I started working on them soon after that discovery as a postdoctoral fellow. And in my lab, we focus on studying Piazza 1 from the molecular to the systems level. So today I'll share with you a little bit of what we have learned about the channel's physiological roles and how those insights instructed our development of a new tool to study it. So I'll start with a project led by Jamie Nurse in the lab, uh, where, in which we examined the role of Piazza 1 in brain development. Now, one may not think of the brain as a mechanically dynamic organ, but in fact, there are several types of mechanical cues that are present, particularly in the developing brain, uh, that shape its morphogenesis. So this can be uh, in, you know, inside the brain that are ventricles, which are fluid spilled spaces, and these spaces have cerebrospinal fluid in them. This cerebrospinal fluid exerts a hydrostatic pressure on the cells surrounding it. Uh, the fluid uh, is beat back and forth by cilia, so it generates a shear flow, which can also affect the cells. And then stiffness, there are, uh, is, is this, the, the stiffness of the cells also matters. And as the brain develops, they develop a the change in stiffness as well as regional differences in stiffness. And then there are cytoskeletal forces that, gen that are produced by cells. So to determine how Piazza 1 may contribute to brain development, we examined the brains of constitutive Piazza 1 knockout mice, and these are mouse lines made by Arden's lab. And we found that the Piazza 1 knockout mice, and this is a global knockout, had a strikingly different morphology compared to the wild type litter mates. It showed thinner neuroepithelium in all the regions that looked quite underdeveloped. And then when we zoomed in, we saw that the organization of cells is disrupted. So you see uneven borders at both the basal as well as the apical edge. So both the organization as well as the proliferation, like the number of cells here is smaller. The organization proliferation is both affected. And then to examine differentiation, we sectioned the brain and stained with a neuronal marker, TUG1. And we saw that the knockout brains have fewer neurons. And you know, the, so we now see differences in organization, proliferation, and differentiation. And we also recapitulated the defects in proliferation and differentiation in vitro by harvesting neural stem cells from these brains, culturing them in the lab, and looking at those processes. So uh, next, we wanted to identify the molecular pathways underlying the phenotype. And so we performed bulk RNA-seq of litimate wild type and PHC1 knockout brains. And to our surprise, the top pathways to come up were related to cholesterol biosynthesis. Then when we looked at the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway shown here on the right, we found that 70% of the genes shown here, uh, of the genes encoding enzymes in the pathway, so each gene that is downregulated by at least 1.5 fold is shown here as a red dot, are uh, reduced in the knockout. And so then we next looked at whether this meant that cholesterol levels were reduced. So we, we measured cholesterol levels using Philippine, which stains free cholesterol, and we found that the knockout cells had reduced cholesterol content. So then we asked whether this impacts differentiation. And uh, we again differentiated the cells in vitro. So we, dif we differentiated into either neurons or astrocytes. And we found that, the, again, like before, that the knockouts have lower uh, neurons differentiating. Uh, and, but then when we uh, did the same differentiation with cholesterol supplemented to the cells, we saw a rescue or a partial rescue of the differentiation and we found, uh, into neurons. And we found the same thing for differentiation into astrocytes, where adding back the cholesterol helped rescue the effect. So bringing all of this together, we see that the absence of PSO1 drastically impacts brain development and that reduced cholesterol biosynthesis in the neural stem cells appears to underlie at least some of the phenotypes that we observed. So this is looking at the effect of the channel at a physiological level, at, you know, at an organ level. And it's fascinating to see those effects, but to really understand how Piazza 1 shapes biological processes, we need to figure out the biophysics of how the channel responds to mechanical forces. And since it was, since Piazza 1 was identified, and, you know, there have been a number of studies across several labs that have demonstrated that it's very versatile in that it can respond to many, many different types of mechanical stimuli. 
uh, that you exert on cells. So you squirt, you put a poke on a cell, you stretch the membrane, you squirt fluid. Uh, a lot, you know, all of these things affect it, uh, in, induce its activity. But cells also generate mechanical forces. So just like you or I would poke or pull on an object to figure out whether it's soft or hard, cells tug on the substrate to determine its stiffness. And these tugging forces, which are called traction forces, are generated by the actomyosin skeleton. And this a lot smaller than the external forces that we can apply onto cells. And so we were curious whether these cell-generated forces that are orders of magnitude smaller than the external forces that cells act experience may activate the channel. And so to, uh, to look at this, we had to move away from the standard assay for channel activity, which is patch clamp electrophysiology. And we had to come up with some new ways of studying the uh, activity of the channel. And we used the fact that the channel allows calcium to come into the cell. And so we can use uh, fluorescent calcium indicators uh, to uh, measure its activity. And if we do that in turf microscopy, we can, uh, we can see specifically what's happening at the cell substrate interface, which is where uh, traction forces are exerted on the substrate. And so this is a very simple experiment that we did where we loaded cells with a calcium indicator uh, and we imaged, it, imaged them in turf microscopy. So we are not poking, pushing, squirting fluid on the cells. Uh, and we observed that wild type cells showed robust calcium signals, whereas when we knocked, down, knocked out the PSO1, we saw a drastic reduction in these. So uh, we then, do, do, to figure out where the channel is coming, the activity is coming from, I mean, if we're not applying force onto the cell, then it must be the cell's forces that are activating it. And so to examine this more carefully, we collaborated with Ian Parker's lab to develop a super resolution analysis algorithm that allowed us to take movies such as the one I just showed you and to, to use uh, and to uh, to, build, uh, to, to build a map of active PSO1 channels, which identifies the source of the signals that is the active channel with sub-pixel precision. And so now the, wherever you saw flashes of light in the movie, you see a white dot. And when we looked at this, we saw that the, cha that, uh, the uh, channel activity didn't seem to be distributed all over the cell. Instead, it occurred in hot spots. And so we asked whether these hotspots of PSO1 activity correspond to regions of traction forces. So for this, we collaborated uh, with Alex Dunn's lab. They had built the perfect tool for uh, doing this experiment, which was a molecular tension, thread-based molecular tension sensor. So without going into details in the interest of time, uh, we combined our approach for making PSO1 activity maps with their approach for making traction force maps. And then we painted the PS1 activity maps onto the traction force maps. And here blue indicates high traction. When we found that regions of PS1 activity were uh, coincided with regions of high traction forces. Then in another set of experiments, we did pharmacological as well as mechanical perturbations to either increase or decrease the traction forces produced by the cell. And we found that it uh, that that PSO1 activity correspondingly increases, and when you had high traction forces, you got uh, you got higher PSO1 activity. And so, taken together, this demonstrates that PSO1 transduces not just the outside in forces, as was well established in the field, but also traction forces, which are orders of magnitude smaller. So, this is a new modality of activating the channel that was not known before. And having found this, we were, of course, curious as to the physiological roles of the cell-generated PSO1 activity. So over this last several years, we have looked at this in a few different systems, including um, stem cell fate, where we showed that in, in neural stem cells, it influences uh, linear choice, so whether the neurons differentiate, uh, whether the neural stem cells differentiate into neurons or astrocytes. And then in collaboration with Wendy Liu's lab, we found that uh, the channel modulates the inflammatory response of macrophages to stiff substrates, such as surgical implants. And in, in collaboration with Adam Paraputian's lab, we found that PSO1 regulates skin wound healing. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the wound healing story, because that in large part shaped how we think about the channel's functions today. So during skin wound healing, keratinocytes, which are located the wounded, 
migrate into the wound bed to reestablish the epithelial barrier. And this process is known to be regulated by cell-generated forces, but the me underlying mechanotransducers have been poorly understood. So Adam's lab found that keratinocytes express PHO1, and then they did a wound healing assay on genetically engineered mice. So they made a, 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 a wound, a full thickness skin wound on the dorsal skin of mice, and examined wound sizes six days after wounding. So now in a skin-specific PHA1 knockout mouse model, they found that the wound sizes were smaller. That means that the wounds healed faster. Whereas in gain-of-function mice, the wound sizes were larger. That is, the wounds healed slower. So to understand how PHA1 was affecting the speed of wound healing, in my lab, we looked. We did live cell imaging experiments, and so we first compared. Uh, we, uh, we first harvested keratinocytes and looked at the migration of single keratinocytes in the knockout mice, and we found that the knockout uh, cells migrated much faster than the wild type cells. So this was in single cells. We did the same experiment in a, uh, in a scratch assay, which is an in vitro model of wound healing, where you make a monolayer of cells and then scratch and then to create a wound and then you watch as the cells migrate to close the wound gap. And again, we found that the knockout cells migrated faster. So then in the, we, again, in that scratch assay, we now induced higher PHO1 activity using a chemical and, uh, agonist called Yoda-1. And we found that in the presence of Yoda-1, the cells had a really hard time migrating to close the wound gap. So they, uh, the, the wound gap remained open. So then we wanted to understand, we wanted to visualize the channel to understand how it may be exerting these effects. And so we used a piezo one td tomato reporter mouse. This is again a model made by Arden's lab with the endogenous piezo one is tagged with a td tomato reporter protein. And we harvested keratinocytes from these mice. And in non-migrating keratinocytes, we found that PHO1 is distributed kind of all over the cell surface. But then when we look at migra actively migrating cells, we found that the channels shown here in red are, are enriched at the back of the cell. So the rear of the cell is a site of maximal retraction forces, and this hinted to us that PHO1 may be involved in retraction. But this is the single cell level. Let's look at the molar layer. So now we again did this, the same idea, the same experiment here of looking at where the channel is located while the cells are migrating. But now we are doing this in a scratch assay. So this is in, in here, I'm showing you the DIC, and this is showing you the TD tomato channel, and this is an emerge channel. And what we found was that the location of the PHO1 channel puncture was quite dynamic. It changed over time. And there were instances when it would get enriched at the wound edge. We stared at these videos for a really long time, and then a pattern started to emerge. So we noticed that at regions of the wound edge where we never saw enrichment of the channel, the wound edge continued to migrate forward to close the wound gap. But then when channel clusters formed, when we saw these, this happening at the wound edge, in the time subsequent to that, the wound edge, instead of moving forward to close the wound gap, was pulling back, was retracting uh, and, and uh, away from the wound edge. So altogether, we learned that PHO1 regulates the speed of wound healing and through the enrichment of channels in the wound edge, leading to an increase in local retraction, which then slows wound healing. And that's why we see faster wound healing in the absence of the channel and, slow, uh, and uh, slower wound healing when you increase the channel activity uh, with the gain of function mutation in the mice. So something that jumped out from this work was that it's not just the activity of the channel, it's also where the channel is located. It's the spatiotemporal dynamics of channel location that contributes to its functional effects. So it's important to track both, but current approaches force us to pick one or the other. You can't look at both at the same time. And so new tools are needed to be able to do this. And so to be in my lab the last few years, this is what we've been doing. 
Um, and I'm really happy to share this uh, tool because it, honestly, it's worked better than we had anticipated. So we used CRISPR engineering to attach a halo tag domain to the endogenous piazza one locus is such that wherever the channel is protein is produced, it's tagged with the halo tag domain. And the halo tag domain is a modified bacterial enzyme that has the ability to self-label itself when a chloroalkane ligand is presented to it. Now, this ligand can be functionalized with a variety of functional groups, so, and, which can be fluorophores or biotin, cross-linkers, you, you can pick what it is. And then we deployed this in human-induced pluripotent stem cells, which we then differentiated into uh, various kinds of cells. Here I'm showing you a neural stem cell. Then we labeled the differentiated cell with a fluorescent halo tag ligand. And we can see the channels, the individual channel functor and image uh, their dynamics. So because of the greater brightness and photostability of the halo tag ligand, we can follow individual functa with greater precision and for longer periods of time than we were able to with the TD tomato model. You can also switch out the halo tag ligand. So the one I just showed you, it's just a fluorophore. Now we are in this uh, image, I'm showing you a cell labeled with a calcium sensitive halo tag ligand. So this, is, uh, this allows us to image calcium and flux through the channel and thus to follow the activity. Now, when we just take a snapshot, because not all channels are active, some puncta appear bright, but most of them are quite dim. So we can zoom in into the, and look at the dynamics of a single punctum and follow its brightness over time. It starts with dim, which we attribute to the channel being closed, and then it, it, you get a pulse of brightness, which we attribute to the channel briefly opening, calcium coming in through the channel and binding to the calcium-sensitive halo tag again, increasing its brightness. So to confirm that this is in, that that is indeed what is underlying the uh, the increases in brightness that we see, uh, we did the same measurements, but now on cells treated with Yoda one, and the, which is the chemical activator for Yoda one, and so you can see in the snapshot alone, you see a lot more puncta now because more of the channels are induced to be open allowing calcium in. And then when we monitor the brightness of a single punctum, we see that it is spending more time in the bright state as we would expect for puncta that are more active. Uh, Meta, we have about uh, two, three minutes left, just, just to let you know. Okay, I might need a couple minutes more, but I'll run through. That's, yeah, that's no problem. Thank you. Um, okay, so these are the traces we just saw plotted next to each other, and we can plot an all points histogram from the traces, which shows a prominent peak for the corresponding in the con basal condition corresponding to the control, and smaller peaks corresponding to the uh, to the open state. And then in the presence of the Euro one, you see the bright peaks increasing at the expense of the dim close peak. So we've created a tool that allows single channel recordings of Piazza 1 with resolution that approaches that of patch clamp activity, but now in intact cells that haven't been poked by electrodes and in a format that allows spatial monitoring of channel activities of channel activity of hundreds of puncta simultaneously on the cell surface. So the advantage to using the iPSCs as our system to do genetic engineering is that we can differentiate them into any kind of cell type or tissue organoid. And so this allows us to also look at the uh, look at PSO1 dynamics at the tissue scale of human PSO1. And so we've taken the first steps with brain organoids where we have differentiated our iPSC line into uh, a, a two and a half dimensional tissue model of the neural tube called micropattern neural rosette. So this has a central lumen surrounded by stem cells uh, around it. And in collaboration with Gopal Upadhyayala, we have imaged these with Eric Betzig's mosaic light sheet microscope. And this is a live neural rosette that's stained with an active marker shown in white and a nuclear marker popping up here in blue. Uh, so you can see the architecture of this neural reset. We're now looking at it from the back. There's a central lumen. Uh, the, and then the PSO1 signal will, is uh, shown in green. And just like we have seen in neural stem cells, we see some autofluorescence blobs, uh, these big blobby things. But based on their characteristic appearance, when we confirm their autofluorescence, because we also see them in the knockout samples that are labeled in the same way, 
we can separate them computationally from the pH of one functor. So now here I'm showing you the computationally separated pH of one functor in magenta. And now we can slice through the organoid model, looking at where the pH of one functor are in the tissue. So this, um, you know, so, so this provides proof of principle that we can see pH of one at a molecular scale in live tissue organoids. And so we can now you know, use the system for higher resolution imaging of pH of one, not just at the cellular scale, but also at the tissue scale. So to summarize, we've developed a new tool which allows us to measure pH of one localization, activity, the spatiotemporal dynamics of both uh, for endogenous human pH of one in native cellular condition. And we can measure activity at a single channel resolution in a variety of cell types and uh, tissue organoids. And this system will also allow us in the future to do human disease modeling. So we have the ability to examine pH of one dynamics and function in many different functional contexts. So we're really excited about all the possibilities that this pH of one halotype tool opens up in studying human pH of one from the molecular to the tissue scale. So I'd like to end with thanking an incredible group of lab members, collaborators, as well as funding sources that allowed this work to be possible. Um, thank you very much for your time, and I'm very happy to take questions.